Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Automate Subcontractor <coughs> Processing with Cost Point Subcontractor Management. I'm Kim Woodcock, an Events Coordinator here at Dell Tech. And before we begin, I have a few administrative items to note. As audio is streamed through your computer speakers, all attendee lines are muted. However, if you have a question during the course of the webinar, just type it in the Q&A panel of your screen at any time, and we'll be sure to address it at the end of the webinar, as time permits or follow up with you offline if we do run out of time. There are resources, including the presentation slides, for you to download in the resources panel of your screen, and you will also receive the on-demand recording of this webinar within 24 hours. And now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's presentation. Joining me today is Steve Fruitman, David Delaney, and Debbie White, all partners at Kintec. Speaking first is Steve. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Kim. And I'd like to welcome everybody to our presentation today. As Kim mentioned, I am Steve Fruitman with Kinetic. Kinetic and Dell Tech are very excited to discuss the new capabilities of the subcontract management enhancements. This greatly expands the subcontract items that many of the users have seen over the years, such as bonds and liens. This brings full business process across CostPoint and T&E to provide an integrated solution for subcontract management. Deb, the next slide, please. Thank you. Our agenda today is discussing the challenges of managing the subcontract process. I'll be walking you through those. The subcontract management process flows in streamlining your approach, which Deb will be walking you through, and the very end, some questions and answers. Um, as Kim had mentioned, um, with the protocol, you'll have the ability to enter questions um, at the bottom of this presentation. Go to the next slide, Deb. Thank you. Just a quick statement regarding Kinetic. We are professional services and developer of solutions. We've been doing this for 15 years. Our staff is a skilled staff that has come from industry Prior, we have deep knowledge of project accounting, government contracting, cost point, and other Dell Tech products. And go ahead and uh, move to the next slide here. I will skip my particular bio. Um, I do need a updated headshot, and we'll go right over to Debbie. And we are very excited to welcome Debbie to the Kinetic team. Debbie brings many years of industry and application experience to our clients. She will be taking you through the bulk of this presentation today. So again, welcome Debbie to Kinetic and look forward to hearing um, as you walk us through that. Go to the next slide, please. And a few quick comments about our other uh, resources on the Kinetic team that work with subcontract solutions. John Aronsett, uh has been working his whole life in material management, his whole working career, I should say, in working ma material management. and not only as a functional, but also application. Um, and he's been one of our key leads for material management and manufacturing clients. Dave Delaney is one of our other uh, partners that works with subcontract management. And Dave focuses on the time and expense solution, which is key for the subcontract management component for recording time, as well as leading our conversion practice. So with that, we'll go right to the, manage, or to the challenges of managing the subcontract process. There's many challenges to the subcontract process. I'll be discussing the challenges. Deb will be providing you with how CostPoint and T&E provide solutions. One thing you will notice, though, is these are extensive. The challenges of subcontractors are quite extensive, and the functionalities are quite impressive. So as we move to communication, what this is getting at is the communication between your subcontractor and your project administrator, subcontract administrator, accounting. So there's a lot of, lot of different groups of people within the company that are key to the communication between themselves and the actual subcontractor. When you bring a subcontractor on, when you win the award or you're looking to, to staff that, it's key to know who are your employees, where are they located, what requirements 
I'm sorry, vendor employees, what requirements do those vendor employees or subcontractors have? Security clearances, ITAR, certifications, skills, training, even location as well. Another challenge with subcontractors is just the very simple fact of how do you communicate to them what to charge? And that by itself provides many challenges. So who's going to be assigned to charge the project and task? How many hours are they authorized for? These are all key components that we will see in the following slides, um, some solutions to those problems. How are time and expenses collected and approved? Now, key thing here is how do you collect the time and expense? Well, you have your subcontractor generally enter time into the system or someone enters it for them. The challenge there is communicating the cost point structure, project account and org, which can be complicated for some clients, and being able to train them to enter that rather than provide them preset code. And so this solution, again, is providing some very big um, solutions to that particular problem. As we get into procurement, which is the next slide, so capturing the project requirements, but we want to capture it in a procurement vehicle, such as the requisition or purchase order. Some key items, such as statement of work, the resource requirements, and some of the uh, skills that they may have, such as the clearances, ITAR, different certifications, as well as the location. So we want to be able to capture that on the procurement. And the challenge is, how do you do that currently? And there are ways that you can do that, but specifically for the subcontractor and for the vendor employees within that subcontractor is key challenge. Of course, once we have it on a, a procurement vehicle, we should be able to derive commitments out of that. But the challenge is in, under the current setup is how would you do that by subcontractor, by individual, as well as manage the modifications to a subcontract agreement. And challenge, taking those modifications by change order and the such down to a level where you could manage it for the subcontract themselves. Time and expense, which is the next uh, slide. This is one of our primary source of transactions. So key thing here is we want to get the charge correct at the very beginning, get it right at the input. And it goes back to the communication of are the correct project charges being charged? How does the subcontractor know which code to use, which project to charge, potentially which account, depending on how t &E is configured, which org, again. So a lot of questions of communication of that, of that information as well as providing some sort of solution to that so that the subcontractor has it correct at the very beginning. Some of the other challenges are how is the time and expense approved for either the subcontractor or the employee within the subcontractor? And are there discrepancies between the invoices that you're paying to your subcontractor versus the time that they claim? And again, you know, challenge is, is there, and solution is, we want to be able to streamline that process so that time entered will lead to invoice to subcontract. But again, that's what uh, Deb will be work, walking through. On the projects, controlling your project budget for a subcontractor is challenging. The risk of overrunning that, that budget is something that, that we try not to do, and managing that budget and managing those overruns, tracking the funding that remains for the subcontract agreement, these are all components that will that create current challenges. At the very bottom says, is your customer happy? Of course, you know, if the subcontractor is not performing, that's a bit of a problem. Strain relationship with your subcontractor, meaning delays in payment, maybe training of uh, staff to get the charges in correct, you know, the constant pressure to do time card corrections if they did not get it right. Again, these are all components of challenges. At a finance level, are the projects being billed late? If we're doing time card corrections, then of course, billings will be late, revenue recognition will be delayed. So time card corrections and time card issues getting t and &E wrong at the very beginning will have very significant ramifications downstream. The very last bullet, of course, is, is 
a, a indirect component of all that, which means, you know, potentially your subcontract management may be a bit higher because of all these errors, you know, that subcontract management could create. Certainly cash flow if your billings are late or if you're correcting bills and the reconciliation effort is uh, is another challenge that we want to be able to to show that the subcontract <coughs> management solutions that are that are built in may bring that. So to the next slide, which is subcontract process. The questions and challenges reflect all that users face with subcontract management. So most people on this call here likely have subcontract subcontractors that they're managing and are looking for up for the ability to utilize these enhancements and to take advantage of these capabilities. Debbie White will walk us through the capabilities introduced by Deltec that will bring the solution <clears throat> that will bring solutions to these challenges. So at that, I will turn it over to Debbie. Good morning everyone. Um, we're going to take just a few minutes here talking about kind of a, a basic subcontract management flow. Um, you know, we're starting out with the pre-award um, before we even get the project. You know, we analyze and we look at which projects we want to bid on. We decide whether we want to bid. And then we start doing our planning and what the expectations of this proposal is going to be. The very first question we might ask ourselves is, do we have the right resources to uh, work on this project if we win it? We're going to look at internal resources. We're going to look at our ability to do new hires. We're also going to take a look to see if we have subcontract um, work or subcontractors that we can work with. Um, you know, again, this is a, a big decision when we're, we're trying to bid on a contract. If we try to use subcontractors, one of the first starts that we're even going to start before we ever uh, uh, um, place the bid out is we're going to get a request for quotes. And in this request for quotes, we, again, we want to identify what subcontractors we might want to use. And we have to give them certain information. What are the requirements, potential statement of work, and things like that. And just kind of start talking with them. So that's kind of the, the pre-award phase of this. The next phase is going to be post-award. We've now won the project, and it goes through various uh, beginning pieces also. Uh, the first being project initiation. We're going to sit down with the folks we won the, the project with, determine what our project structure is going to be, what levels of the project are funded in specific ways, um, how many different tasks there are, and what kind of uh, reporting we need to do at that task level. As we're doing this, we're also looking at how we're going to staff each piece of that project. Again, we're going to pull out our subcontractor agreement or request for quotes, and we're going to initiate our subcontractor agreement. Now, this is in one instance a purchase order type um, that can be done, um, you know, that you do today. And then also we have our subcontractor employee onboarding. So who are the vendor employees going to be or our subcontractor resources? What are their certifications? What are their skills? Um, and, you know, and, and basically you know, uh, kind of building a database of their capabilities. The, other op next, or the next step we're looking at is who's doing what? So at this point, and I apologize, I dropped my phone in for. At this point, we're looking at our internal resources. How can we use those to staff these positions? And then we look at our subcontractor resources and we start assigning them work. So who's going to work on what task? What is, what is the work definition? Where's the location of the work? Um, you want to minimize travel expenses. You're going to be taking a look at all different things like that. Then we get to the results. As we start working on a project, we want to see our results. We want to be able to collect our labor and subcontractor time and expenses. We want to do accurate, on-time, efficient project billings. And then we want to make sure that we can pay our subcontractor vendor for their employees' work. So it kind of goes through a standard flow of, of how this would work. The next thing we're going to talk about is 
streamlining your approach with CostPoint. And this, uh, we're going to spend a few minutes going through how CostPoint can help improve your subcontractor management processes you have today and help reduce the challenges that Steve had talked about early on in the presentation. So one of the things to point out is there is a new module in CostPoint called the Subcontractor Management Module. Within this module, it uh, has a variety of different options to track work assignments. It has a set of rules that control how subcontractor management should work. And these rules can control project charging. Um, you can set up flags to prevent um, charging more time than funding on your purchase order or your subcontractor agreement. You set up validation rules for how time and expense work. You can indicate period of performance restrictions, that if a work assignment has a particular period of performance, you cannot do work outside of that period of performance. And we can actually create the subcontractor invoice for our subcontractor supplier or vendor and then we process it through to approvals. And one of the big things with this is it can eliminate some of the reconciliation or communications you have with your subcontractor vendor. Um, we're kind of trying to help manage that into the process from your side of the house. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. First thing we're going to take a look at here is vendor employees. Now, um, for those of you who use CostPoint today, um, you've probably seen some changes in the vendor employee table that is a subtask off of the vendor table. Uh, we've expanded um, what attributes belong to the vendor employee, so you can capture and track history and qualifications for each vendor employee by name. And with this, it's going to track things like uh, a default GLC or PLC for that person. Um, it can track default hourly rates, including multi-currency rates. We have a default manager and we have a default title for that um, vendor employee. You can also track what skills they have, what trainings, what certifications. And then for those of you who have secured projects or ITAR related projects, you can track whether they're a U.S. citizen, whether they have ITAR uh, status uh, that can be used on ITAR specific projects, or if they have security clearances, top secret, secret, uh, how that security clearance is defined. And then the last piece of this, you can track the property that you've issued to that person. So if you've issued them a laptop, a badge, cell phone, whatever pieces of property you're, you're actually issuing to that vendor employee to use, you can track that within the subcontractor management. Now again, a lot of these things are defaults set up for the vendor employee, and we're going to talk as we move through this how they can be overridden or they can default in from different places. The next piece uh, is procurement planning. And procurement planning, there's been several changes made to, re to support subcontractor management to request for quotes, following by vendor quotes, and then our purchase requisition. So at the request for quote level, which we talked about as being pre-award, you want to be able to attach maybe a first uh, pass statement of work so that you can get a more accurate quote from that subcontractor vendor. Um, you may want to have details in that statement of work outlining what the work is. You may want to specify the location of where the work is being performed because you want to cut down any travel expenses as a pass-through um, charge. You also can indicate other qualifications and whether they have security clearance requirements or not so that you can kind of fine tune what you're asking that subcontractor vendor to supply back to you in the form of a vendor quote. Following along with that, the vendor quote can contain the same information. Because again, if we haven't won the project yet, we're getting ready to win it, we want to be able to take all those vendor quotes we've received, go back and analyze that data to determine which subcontractor and vendors we want to place subcontractor agreements with. 
And then if we go down one step further, it goes into the purchase requisition. And again, the same information. On a purchase requisition, you can indicate a statement of work. Um, you can have the security requirements. And you can drill down to a lot of details. You can actually, on your procurement planning or your requisition, you can identify for a given requisition line that you need a DBA administrator, a senior developer, and maybe a QC person. Um, or an Oracle administrator um, or Oracle DBA. So you can drill down to very specifics on this. You can, again, indicate the work location of where the work is if you are trying to um, satisfy a, a, your clients um, or customers' um, requirements to cut on travel expenses. And you can indicate hourly rates that you want to negotiate for that or you want, it, you want the, the uh, requisition cut for. And one final step you can do is you can be very, very specific. You can take this down to an actual vendor employee level. So you've worked with John Doe at company ABC before and you want John Doe on your project. So you can actually take it down to an actual vendor employee name to do this request for quote or to, and the requisition. Now, once the requisition is approved and it's in the buyer's hands, um, we want to cut our standard or blanket agreement. Now, this is a two new types of purchase orders in cost point for support of subcontractor management. The standard uh, subcontractor agreement works very similar to a standard purchase order. Um, it can be a two-way or three-way match, you know, has kind of the same rules of a standard purchase order. Uh, a blanket, again, works much like a blanket, where you can actually offer a, up a blanket agreement and then do releases against it as you want to control the workflow of the vendor employees uh, uh, coming in to do work for you. So you have two options for that. Again, a statement of work. Uh, the statement of work can be tracked by revision. Um, there's always a lot of modifications on of contractor agreements. Statement of work can also be modified and tracked. Uh, security requirements, again, U.S. citizenship, ITAR um, certified, or do you need a top secret or secret clearance? You can drill down to, again, very detail-oriented. I can identify that I need senior DBAs, I need um, a junior developer, I need a QC person and I need an administrative person. Um, I can indicate the actual rates for each of those individuals or types of individuals. And again, I can be very specific. I can place a purchase order for an exact person if I want to. These are optional fields. You don't have to put them on the purchase order, um, but, but they do allow you to do that if you need to. Change order management, uh, this has actually been upgraded that will also track changes to that statement of work. Because we all know with subcontractor agreements, the statement of work is very, very important. That outlines kind of the rules and specifications of what that particular agreement covers. And then you have new, new print options. And you can see by the print screen here, you've got some options on how you're printing your purchase orders that you can print out all of this information, including a vendor employee name, on your hard copy of your purchase order if you desire to. Again, this is optional. It's set up in the print options for what subcontract management um, pieces you want to print on your purchase order. The other piece with subcontractor agreements is going to be related to your three-way or two-way match. We all know that some companies are very precise when they place their purchase orders. They know down to the detail how many hours they, they want to place the subcontractor agreement for, the exact rate, or a period of performance. We also know at the time we place that purchase order, the exact project account and uh, org we want to charge to. And when I'm talking about projects, all the way down to the project and task that should be charged. 
Now, for a three-way match purchase order, it does expect hours to be received. Um, typically, a three-way match tracks commitments on the quantity of hours you're ordering. And the other piece with the three-way match is, again, it can be very, very specific. It can be a very detailed purchase order. Um, Purchase order changes would be used to move m monies from one uh, project and task to another project and task if desired. On the opposite side of that, um, we have a two-way match, which commitments are based on dollar. There is no receipt required. And a lot of times with a two-way match, it may be um, committed at the top level of the project because at the time you place this order, you don't know exactly where you want those charges to fall. So commitments would be at a top level until the actual charges start coming in, which divvies them up between the project and tasks they're supposed to go to. The higher level purchase order could be for a lump sum of $2 million, and that $2 million can be spread on any task of a project you want it to. Um, and again, it might not have nearly as many details as a three-way match. It's completely optional which ones you use. You can have a detailed three-way match. You can have a very simplistic two-way match um, from one uh, subcontract vendor to another subcontract vendor, just depending on how you want to use it. But it's very important to notice this. The next piece, you know, as we go through this process, we've talked a little bit about a work assignment. For a three-way match, a lot of the details will flow directly into a work assignment. And that's basically assigning the work to a set of resources to say, here's what you're going to go work on. For two-way match, there's less data on the purchase order. A lot more information is assigned at the work assignment level and does not default in for you. So again, just some things to consider with this. Both are acceptable. Um, both give you a lot of flexibility on how you want to set up your subcontractor agreement. Now the next piece is, to me, the heart and soul of subcontractor management, and that is the work assignment. The work assignment allows the project manager to manage um, their projects and the subcontractors that are, being char or that are charging their projects. Um, it is basically what it sounds like. It assigns work to a group of individuals or single individuals and flows through the rest of the subcontractor management process. The uh, unique thing about the work assignment, and one of the ch things that have always been a challenge before is you want to do uh, your project billings for the actual hours incurred or the actual expenses incurred. And at the same time, you have to turn around and pay your subcontractor vendor um, as those hours are um, incurred for their folks' work. So it's almost a full cycle process here. We have to pay vendors. We have to bill our customers for this work. The work assignment actually helps you do that. Uh, when you set up a work assignment in cost point, it's going to be tied to a purchase order and then to a purchase order line so that we can actually control the amounts we're spending against that purchase order. We can see what's available on the purchase order, and we can divvy up the work as we need to based on the purchase order line. Along with that, we can assign detailed work to the subcontractor employee. So we can indicate that we need for the month of January give it a period of performance, we can indicate that we need 120 hours of uh, senior DBA's time at $250 an hour. So again, very specific. You know what you're going to pay that person. You know um, what they need to charge and how much time you're going to allow for them to, to charge against the work assignment. The other thing the work assignment will do is it actually validate against your project workforce. So if you've already got a project workforce set up, you can actually um, auto-load in that workforce into the work assignment for a particular project. So it gives you a little bit more control like that. Um, another thing, again, I said the work assignment could be a 30-day period of time. It can be a longer period of time. It could be a shorter period of time just depending on how much control you want to place on your work assignments to your subcontractor resources. 
And the nice thing about work assignments, and again, we're going to talk a couple more slides about it here, is these work assignments give an easier way for the subcontractor resource to charge their time and expenses in T&E 10. So instead of having to look up a project, account, and organization every time they put in their timesheet, they simply put in the work assignment that they've been charged. And it automatically knows what PAO and what rules about that work assignment should be um, worked in with their time that they're charging. So some of the rules that you can set up at a work assignment level, you can indicate whether you want to allow overtime charging. Um, if you do not allow overtime charging and someone works overtime, you have options to push that time into an unallowable account and not have it go directly to the project. You can indicate whether they can charge outside of the period of performance of this work assignment. You can actually check purchase order funding. If your purchase order is for 40 hours and the work assignment is for 40 hours, you can set it up that they cannot exceed that 40 hours, which is the funding on the purchase order. You have uh, options to exceed the PO funding but not exceed what is on the work assignment. You can place security validations. If they are, don't have the clearance to work on the work assignment, they will not be able to charge that work assignment. And again, as I've mentioned before, you can decide how you want any overcharges. Do they get hit directly to the project? Or would you like to see them go to an unallowable expense or labor account? And then it asks what those accounts are. So again, pretty detailed rules that you can establish per work assignment. Some may be more flexible, some may not, depending on how you set it up. And this screen, um, this is a, just a, a little bit larger screen for you to take a look at of the work assignment. And again, you can see the work assignment ID. You've got an approval code for the work assignment, a status of it being approved. Our PO number indicates the vendor can indicate uh, different information on the work assignment. It can then drill down to the charges, which are tied to that PO and the PO line, what the title of the charge is, the description, the period of performance. And then again, you can take it down to a pool of people, or you can drop it into being exact vendor employees that are allowed to charge this work assignment. It's a very helpful tool in helping a project manager manage their subcontractor resources as they work on their jobs. Now, how does time and expense play into this? So, um, with T&E 10, which is now an integral part of Cost Point, the work assignments are directly uh, looked up from T&E 10. It can, again, default on, um, or default in information based on that work assignment for the subcontractor employee. They can charge their labor. They can enter expense reports. And again, these will default in. It's much more efficient, accurate charging. It should eliminate errors. If John Doe is assigned to one work assignment and that's the only one he can work on, that's the only charge he'll be able to hit within T&E. Um, management approval, it goes through the same T&E approval process as a regular employee's time or a regular employee's expense report. Now then it comes to what the differences are. Once that timesheet is approved, it actually goes into cost point in a new staging table for labor and a separate staging table for expenses. This, this staging table is used to help us create an invoice that we're going to send to our subcontractor or vendor and get their approval on for what we're going to be paying them for their employees. So let's take a look now at the subcontractor invoice. Um, again, the invoice is created within Cost Point. 
based on the actual timesheet lines and actual expenses your subcontract resources have entered in and had approved. It's going to provide full details of the project and of an unallowable charging. So again, based on your rules at the work assignment, the work assignment was for 40 hours and to complete the job, the, the person had to work 42 hours. Those two hours can go to an unallowable account. Now you've got this uh, invoice kind of generated, and it's sitting kind of in a, a pending status at this point. And you've got 40 hours charged to the project, and then you have these extra two hours that were required to finish what needed to be done to, for the success of the project. And you want to be able to allow them to hit the project. You do have an option before you approve this um, subcontractor invoice, and it is, it's, again, it's a a little bit different term because you're actually creating an invoice for your vendor. You do have an option to edit um, and review this before you approve it or you submit your first approval. Um, being able to edit it is very important because you do have an option to modify rates if you need to. You have an option to remove time. So for example, that two hours of um, unallowable time you can actually move that and put that on a new invoice um, on a, um, and kind of reclass it to be billed later once you get approval for those two hours if you need to. So it does give you a, a lot of flexibility here um, in how you want that invoice to be kind of finalized. Now once you've finalized it, you'll probably have an internal approval on it. You can also print this out email it straight to your subcontractor vendor and get their approval before processing this any further. And this is a very important piece because one of the main challenges with dealing and managing a subcontractor management vendor is the reconciliation between their employee charging time in your system and their employee charging time in their system. If there are any discrepancies, then it becomes a discrepancy. What do we pay for? Um, there's a problem with accounts payable. We get an invoice in with hours that we don't agree with, or we're not sure where those hours came from. So we're digging around, trying to find all their time cards, balance it against this. This kind of gives you a little bit more control. Of You're going to generate the invoice. You're going to say, okay, here's what we have. Here's what we're willing to pay for. Uh, let's, uh, do you accept this? If you don't, let's work this out before it ever gets to an AP port, uh, stage. Now, once this is approved, um, it becomes automatically a purchase order voucher. So just by setting the final approval, and again, normally there are two approvals. You'll have an internal approval. You'll have an approval that your subcontractor vendor will notify you back so that you can go ahead and approve it in the system. Um, once it's approved, you have a purchase order voucher. If your purchase order is a three-way match requiring a receipt, this will automatically create your receiving record for you. So if you're billing for 40 hours of time, it will go ahead and create a receipt on the date of this approved um, invoice or subcontractor invoice indicating that those 40 hours have been received and accepted. So you no longer, for a three-way match, have to go do a receipt for hours. It's going to automatically do that for you. And again, the purchase order voucher, the screens look very similar. Uh, there are some changes, though, with the purchase order voucher. If it is a sub purchase order voucher that is generated from a subcontractor invoice and you need to make a change to it, you need to delete the voucher and that will put it back into the invoice status phase where you can update the invoice and resubmit it again. So that's an important feature. Um, again, it, you're, it is going to be based on the actual la uh, labor and expense charges that were approved, and it will drill down. So when you hit the vendor subtask at the bottom for vendor labor, there's now a new subtask underneath of that will, that will drill down to all of the vendor labor and expense reports associated with that vendor labor line. 
so that you can actually see the work assignment drill downs all the way through. Okay, now we're just uh, going to talk about um, what the advantages of subcontractor management are. First, it is a very streamlined approach, a very a circular approach um, that can help solve many of the challenges of managing your subcontractor resources. And again, you know, it, it's, it's always difficult to manage your own employees, let alone manage somebody else's employees doing work for you. So you want to make sure that um, with subcontractor management, it can, it can aid in resolving that. Two, anytime there's multiple companies involved, you know that it, it's very difficult uh, with the communication and reconciliation and things like that. So what, some of the charge, uh, advantages of subcontractor management uh, will be your visibility and control of the employee's workload. You're going to be, have full visibility of who's working on what at any point in time. You also have visibility from a project manager's, a project manager's level to see what funding is left on the purchase requisition or purchase order or, per, or subcontractor agreement. Um, it's always necessary to make a lot of modifications. Um, I know many of you know that you've got a four or five inch subcontractor agreement filed in your file cabinet somewhere. Um, with every modification that's been on it. Wouldn't it be nice for the project manager to be able to see what's left and be able to place a requisition ahead of time to go in and add more funding to that subcontract agreement instead of the day that he runs out of funding or she runs out of funding. Um, you also have the automation of the labor and expense collection. You train your subcontractor employees on t and &E 10. They charge work assignments instead of project account and orgs, and they are limited to the work assignments that they can charge, only the ones assigned to them. Configurable charging rules to reduce timesheet collections. Again, if you don't want to allow them to exceed uh, uh, the number of hours assigned to a work assignment, you can set the work assignment up that way. If they try to charge over that, they're going to have a problem and they're going to have to come back to you and say, okay, I, I worked these two extra hours, what are we going to do? It's up to you at that point if you want to modify that work assignment and allow that two hours or you tell them to go ahead and charge if it hits unallowable. So um, it does give you a little bit more control with regard to how your um, um, time and expense rules apply to your subcontractor resources. Again, much more accurate labor and expense collection. Um, everything is, it can be very tied down where your subcontractor employees know what they have to charge, they don't have to make a lot of decisions, or they can't accidentally charge the wrong task on a project. Uh, reducing your reconciliation efforts between you and your subcontractors. Uh, to me, you know, this, this is a big deal. Um, you have, again, they've got their timekeeping system. You have your timekeeping system. They, their employees are keying time into both systems. One of the things that with this particular feature, we really wanted to try to, to um, help clients work better with their subcontractor vendors. You need them. You want to stay friends with them. You want to you know, make your subcontractor vendors happy. So this allows you to give full visibility kind of up front as time is being approved and charged to the subcontractor vendor. So there really aren't any surprises. You know, um, they can go back and look at what invoice they're going to send to you. They know what the problems are going to be ahead of time. Uh, so it gives you a little bit more time to work them out instead of them ending up in accounts payable and then you're, you've got your uh, accounts receivable and accounts payable person going back and forth with it. Um, improved communications, again, improved communications all the way around. Your resources know what they're working on. Um, you are communicating with their employer. And, you know, your own customers uh, have improved customer satisfaction because, again, you can bill them on a timely basis. The time is approved and the expenses are approved before they ever get billed to the client. 
um, and everything's kind of uh, tightened up with how, how this is done. And then again, your timely and accurate project billing. We all want to get paid. Um, your subcontractor wants to get paid. You want to bill your customers um, on a timely and accurate basis. Uh, this process allows within uh, a, a matter of 10 minutes between a timesheet being approved to creating that subcontractor invoice to know exactly what you're going to be billing your, your project. So it gives you, um, you know, cuts out a lot of the, the manual paperwork. It cuts out a lot of the, the middleware that has to go in between this process. So in summary, you know, this is a, a full cycle process. We, we start out with subcontract agreement. From that agreement, we create our work assignments. And again, it could be one large work assignment or many small work assignments. The work assignment flows directly into time and expense 10 for labor and expense collection. Your managers can approve those timesheets. Once approved, they go into staging tables where they can be picked up for your subcontractor invoice. Once the subcontractor invoice is approved, it goes directly into a PO voucher that can be processed through accounts payable. It will still go through the same approvals as accounts payable. If you exceed the purchase order funding, there may show up as a discrepancy against it. None of, none of that will change from your standard AP processes you have today. Once posted, it will update project billing so that you can see uh, the hours and expenses charged to your project so you can turn those around for your invoices. And with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and open this up to questions and answers. Okay, if anybody has a question, um, feel free to type it in the Q&A panel of your screen at any time. And like I said before, if we didn't, if we don't have time to get to your question, we'll be sure to address it offline. Now I'll turn it back to Deb so she can take some of those questions. So it looks like um, well, we have quite a few questions out here. Uh, one of the questions we have is, do I need to put the resource information in detail on the purchase order? And again, the answer to that is no, this is completely up to you on how you want to uh, create your purchase orders. Again, with a two-way or three-way match, they can be very high level. They can be very um, uh, detailed level, just depending. If they are at a very high level, the work assignment controls much of the detail. If your purchase orders are very detailed level, that information will default into the work assignment where you can manually update it if you want to, or you can leave it exactly how the purchase order is set up. Uh, one of the questions we have is uh, how are subcontractor invoices created for firm fixed price and CPFF subcontracts? Again, it would be um, the same the same way. I mean, right now with a, a purchase order voucher with subcontractor labor, we normally fill out the vendor labor information in the PO voucher screen, which goes and updates project billing. This information would uh, be the same information that we, we see in the system today, but it is expanded with more details and does automatically flow in from an approved timesheet or expense report. But the, the process between a firm fixed price or CPFF would be exactly the same. Uh, well, we got a ton of questions here. Uh, what version of CostPoint am I presenting on? This is CostPoint 711. The subcontractor management feature is in 711 and works with T&E 10. Um, next question, is there a budget versus actual report that shows the run rate? Currently there is not. Um, we can certainly ask uh, Deltex product management uh, that that would be a good enhancement request. We would need to do this, though, today with a Cognos report. Again, these are new tables within CostPoint that are available with Cognos.
then another question here, how can we manage commitments for multi-resource and multi-CLIN contracts? Um, again, for a multi, uh, com if you want to manage your commitments at a CLIN level or task level on your project, normally this would require separate lines on your purchase order, and they would be more detailed lines. So again, um, you know how you're looking at this. Um, you could still do two-way two-way match, but I, again, I think each line on the purchase order would represent a separate project account and org that represents each CLIN number. So I, I think you're going to still have to have more details on your purchase order if you want to see commitments down to a CLIN level. Um, again, if, if you don't have that requirement, and um, um, you know, one of the things, I, there's, it's probably a 50-50 split between clients who do things on their purchasing or their purchase orders at a very detailed level down to the commitment level right up front or those who have a two-way match where they're not sure until you get into the project what tasks charges are going to go to. Oh, uh, the subcontractor invoice. The question is, will the invoice have the subcontractor employee information? Um, yes, it will. It's going to drill down to who the actual person was, show the actual hours that they worked, their actual expenses that they charged, um, so that you have um, that full information. Because again, you want to share that with your subcontractor vendor to make them as comfortable with as possible with the time um, on that, so that you, you don't have a lot of accounts payable challenges with them. The next question, um, it doesn't seem correct for us to prepare a subcontractor's invoice. Shouldn't they be preparing from their own system? And how does this pass a DCAA audit? Normally, they would prepare it in their own system. This gives you a little more control on that. It's not that they won't prepare their own invoice, but this does give you um, a little bit of a head start with them, because basically saying, Here's the time we've reported. Here's what we have approved. They can match that up to their invoice. You do have an option to overwrite the invoice number on the one created from subcontractor management with their invoice number. Uh, that can be done prior to approval um, so that they, they have their complete audit trail back to them. It is a different concept. Um, as far as passing a DCA audit, really doesn't make a, it shouldn't make a difference with that because again you can reference their invoice number as long as they agree with the information that's on the invoice and again you know you, you've, you've got to look at it as you're trying to give your vendor employee as much insight to what their employees have worked for you so that you can help with any of these reconciliation issues and let's take one more here Uh, the next one, do you have a solution where subcontractors do not have to key time into their time, the time system and cost point? And unfortunately, no, this is, um, you know, subcontractor management does require cost point 711 and it does require p and &E 10 to automate the process. Without the subcontractor management license, you can create subcontractor agreements and put a variety of information on them. But to really automate the process, it is pretty streamlined with cross point 711 and TNE 10. And Kim, at, at this point, um, if, if I've missed any of the questions here, uh, we'll make sure we get those answered for you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Kim. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so now, before I conclude, um, I just want to talk about Insight. So. Insight offers more than 300 unique sessions of training, discussion of best practices, case studies, and business strategy that are offered during this three-day event. The conference will be in Nashville at the Gay Lord Opry Resort from October 23rd to October 26th. For more information and to register, please check out deltechinsight.com. 
And before I officially conclude, I want to remind you that all registered attendees will be receiving the on-demand recording of today's webinar within 24 hours via email. And there are many questions that we didn't get to, so we'll be sure to answer them offline. Also, we'd appreciate if you filled out the short survey that you'll see at the conclusion of this webinar. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and please visit deltech.com for more upcoming Deltech events.